Oh, hello! Today we are wrapping up my reading for the month of March, which frankly was kind of a weird reading month for me. I got, really got in a rereading mood. I also had a lot of like collaboration stuff happening on my channel, which was great. I enjoyed it, but it does take up some of like my reading energy. I'm also DMing a new Dungeon and Dragons group, so I spent a lot of time diving into those books and spending some of my free time working on that. So all in all, I didn't have as many new reads as I normally do. I still read plenty. I think I read like 16 new books. That's a lot. But normally that's closer to like 20 to 25. So anyway, all that to say, I was reading some longer books. I was rereading a lot. And all in all, just kind of an unusual-ish reading month for me, but a very, very strong one because I am happy to tell you I did not have any disappointments this month. Yeah, I don't think I had anything that I would truly call a disappointment in the month of March. So we will start with stats and then we will just do my surprises and my hits because we don't have any disappointments to talk about this month. Hurrah for all. Okay, as I mentioned, I read 16 books, 16 new books, I should say, in the month of March. And 14 of those were ones that I owned. Two of them were ones that I did not own. I read a total of 5,888 pages for an average book length of 368 pages. The average age of book that I read was 14 years old. And the average amount of time a book had been on my TBR was eight months. In terms of where I got books from, the biggest category was from publishers because I did read seven arcs this month and then followed by, by Amazon, which makes sense because I did read a lot of ebooks this month. I paid for 37.5% of the books that I read and the average book cost was $3.08. Typical spread of genre for me with my two biggest genres being mystery and speculative romance but I do think this was a month where I was reading a lot more variety like I read onesie twosies from a lot of things rather than sort of like getting in the mood for something and binging it so typical types of genres but a little different on kind of the spread of them. And then as you can see, rating wise, very, very strong month. My most frequently given rating was a four star, which is unusual for me. And I had one four and a half star and one five star. Four and a half star is a favorite of the year. A five star is an all time favorite. So I was mentioning earlier, I didn't have any disappointments. And my average rating this month was 3.7, let's see, 3.71875, uh, which is much higher than my normal average rating. Usually if it's over three, three stars, I feel like that's a win. And um, anything over I'd say like a 3.3, .3 I think is particularly strong. So I can hardly think of a month where I've had such a high average rating. So what I did read, I very much enjoyed, I just didn't read quite the same level a volume of it that I would normally read. And then I think we will transition into talking about the challenges that I met this month, which were a lot. So I read seven arcs. I won't mention the ones that I'm gonna talk about in different categories, but I will mention two of the arcs I read actually, I had a very similar response to. Both of them were mystery thrillers that really hit the spot for me in terms of the tropes kind of combos I like and the character types I like. And both were three and a half to a four star. And because of my reviewing policy, I always bump those up to four stars. And that was Her Last Holiday by C.L. Taylor and The Ivies by Alexa Dunn. So the Her Last Holiday, a version of an isolated close circle mystery, I would say it's probably better described as an isolation thriller, where basically we have parallel timelines and people are on this wellness retreat in both of those timelines. In the first one, we know that things went really bad. And in the second one, we have one of the family members from how the first one went really bad coming, trying to investigate and find out what happened originally. So this just hit a lot of my pleasure buttons. And I do find CL Taylor is like her sensibilities are very much what I like in kind of mystery thriller these days. I would say her and like Ruth Ware so far I'm finding are the kind of contemporary mystery thriller authors whose books seem to consistently have a lot of the elements that I personally like and sort of the tone I like. Um, because in contrast to someone like Lucy Foley, who the setups are things I like, the actual writing and kind of character types, it has that sort of like cynical-ish 
edge to domestic thrillers that it's just not my favorite, which is why I do also tend to enjoy YA thriller because it doesn't usually have that same kind of vibe. Anyway, all that to say, I really enjoyed this one from CL Taylor. I gave it four stars and I had very similar feelings about The Ivies by Alexa Dunn. I should mention I consider Alexa to be an online friend, so like take this review with that caveat, but I really liked this as a YA thriller. It is set at an elite boarding school and basically imagine this as if the Mean Girl group in Mean Girls were super competitive about getting into specific Ivy League schools and like Regina George is getting into Harvard and no one else is allowed to apply to Harvard and then like one of them dies and sh like shit gets real from there. I the the only thing that like didn't quite work for me in this one was getting into the pacing. Oh I should mention the thing that didn't totally work for me in the CL Taylor one was the actual resolution to some of the character arcs at the very end of the book. I liked the idea of them but the actual execution didn't totally work for me but again three and a half to four stars I deferred to a four star for it and for the Ivies it's actually the opposite issue. I had a little bit of a hard time kind of getting into the flow of the book but I actually loved the way that it ended. Um, I know Alexa mentioned that it was a divisive ending. For me I really liked it and I felt like it struck a nice balance of like darkness but tonally appropriate darkness for YA which sometimes bothers me in YA books where I'm like I feel like this doesn't actually make sense for a YA audience. But anyway, for me it really struck that balance nicely and if you are somebody who likes Rory Gilmore and like her dynamics at Chilton but you want it as a YA thriller with, with her in Paris getting swept up in like a murder mystery kind of thing, this is a book for you. So anyway, I had really a good time with that one and like I said I was between three and a half and four stars but I bumped it up to four because of my review policy. So anyway, had very similar feelings about both Her Last Holiday and The Ivies. If you're somebody who's shares a lot of my sensibility and mysteries. I think that these will work pretty well for you. And then The Intimacy Experiment by Rosie Dannon. Did I talk about this in my mid-month check-in? I can't remember if I did, but I gave this four stars and actually really enjoyed it. For me, this was one where I felt like the dialogue was a little off. Like I really loved the content of what was being said, but the way it was delivered felt kind of unnatural to me. So that's what kept me from just like fully loving this because I would say this was between a four and a four and a half kind of thing. But I really like this a lot. If you were looking for a contemporary romance that feels very like modern and has just like sensibilities that make sense in 2021 and also incorporates themes around like religion and how that incorporates into our kind of like sexual and romantic identities. I think that this is a book that you would really enjoy. It's basically a romance between a former sex worker who now has sort of like an empire of like sex toys and stuff who gets recruited by a hot rabbi <laughs> to um, come give a series of lectures about like modern intimacy at his synagogue as a way to sort of like drum up younger attendance and um, love ensues from there. And I just thought it was very charming. It definitely makes me excited to read more from this author. And yeah, I think all the other arcs I'm going to talk about in my other categories. So other things that I got done, I had my 21 books I want to read in 2021 included Assassin's Quest by Robin Hobb, which I talked about at length in my mid-month check-in, so I'll refer you there. I did, this is a book of great highs and lows. I ultimately gave it three and a half stars, but I'm very excited to continue in the overall realm of the Elderling series. And I think that this was definitely a very solid entry. I had an arc slash uh, reading Roberts entry for Legacy from Nora Roberts, which I again talked about in my mid-month check-in. I had The Tenant of Wildfell Hall was on my classics TBR for the year that I read and I'm going to talk more about. For book club, I read The Widow of Rose House by Diana Biller, which was probably the closest thing to a disappointment for me. But I didn't, I kind of knew that there were people who loved and hated it. And ultimately, I thought that this was fine, but it wasn't my favorite. There is an entire book club of us talking about that on my channel with me, Bethany, Leanna, and Amanda um, for the Blades and Bodice Ripper book club. So I will try to remember to link somewhere that discussion if you guys want to go hear full thoughts. I liked it the best out of the four of us and I didn't love it but it was fine. And yeah I think those were all the challenges. So we will segue to talking about things that surprised me. So first is an arc that I read for Dial A for Aunties by Jesse Q. Sutano I believe is the author's name 
And this was a surprise to me because I was, the way this had kind of gotten pitched to me was that it was a rom-com with like a mystery thrown into it. And really it has rom-com elements and it has like mystery thriller elements, but it's really like a wacky intergenerational family comedy. It is a unique book. I have never read something quite like this. I think it is going for and achieves the tone of maybe sort of like a K-drama, though in this case I believe that the characters are of Chinese and Indonesian descent, but it's, you know, it's that kind of vibe of like very soapy, like maybe sort of like a telenovela, kind of like it's very dramatic it's very melodramatic and like cr like really bonkers things are happening all the time and the whole thing is that our main character has three aunties and then her mom they're all running a business together they're in each other's business and she basically they set her up on a blind date that blind date attempts to assault her. I want to be clear that that happens, but then also give the caveat that the way it is dealt with is both that that was totally not okay, but also it doesn't ever really feel totally threatening because it's so sort of soapy and melodramatic that it didn't feel like really triggering for lack of a better word. So just FYI there, but he tries to assault her and when she's trying to get him away from her, she accidentally kills him. <laughs> and so she, her and her aunties and her mom are gonna be going on, um, like they have this wedding business and they need to figure out what to do with the body, but they also have to be like working. And then there's this boy who she was with back in the day and they broke up basically for, because of like some of her family baggage and so is she gonna get back together with him and so it's just like this this really delightful like hodgepodge of genre and tone that I don't know was like my favorite thing I've ever read I think I gave this three and a half stars but it was one of the most unique things I've read in a long time and I definitely respected just like it had a thing it was trying to do and it like went for it wholeheartedly so if you're looking for something kind of sudsy and fun I think that this would be like a really good sort of like weekend like sitting by the pool kind of a read. So yeah, it was different and fun. Next, I had People We Meet on Vacation by um, Emily Henry as my next kind of surprising pick because I think I, so I gave this four stars and I did enjoy it because I'm going to say some things that make it sound like I'm being really critical. I want to make it clear that this was a really enjoyable read and Emily Henry's actual writing continues to be something that I really, really enjoy and kind of makes it that any book she puts out I'm probably going to be pretty interested in. But it, this book surprised me because I felt like it was quite serious in some of its actual like themes it was going for. And I think that this is a book, so basically it's a book that's told in alternating timelines. You guys know that's not my favorite. But in particular in this case, I think that this book would have been much more effective for me had it been told wholly linearly. I think it would have required some restructuring in some bits, but I think it would have been more effective because it's kind of got some of somewhat of like a When Harry Met Sally kind of vibe in terms of it's a friends to lovers story and initially the friends to lovers transition does not go well and really the present timeline is trying to write what was wrong in terms of these two people's dynamic. I also think this book has a lot of really interesting and serious things to say about how like figuring out who you want to be and where you want to be and like how to get what you want. Basically that sometimes so our main thing female character. She's always wanted to be this travel writer. And she's going on this journey of realizing that maybe it's not so much that she's always wanted to travel. It's that she's maybe been kind of running away from dealing with some of the things that have been difficult in her past and her kind of making peace with that. And I actually thought that that was a really well done sort of like quarter life crisis coming of age kind like a, a late coming of age type story, which makes sense because I think Emily Henry actually comes from YA. So it makes sense that she does like sort of a coming of age type plot line or like finding your place in the world plot line pretty well. But I think that it would have been a much more effective romance because I don't know that this worked wholly for me as a romance. I think the romance itself would have been a lot more effective if the story had been linear and kind of like when Harry Met Sally, how you're seeing these two people's relationship develop over time and just letting it kind of be a slow burn. I think the book would have been more to my personal liking had that been the way it was structured. I don't know that this was like the wrong choice, but I do think that through this choice, it to me undermines it being a romance per se and makes it more of like a general fiction book with a heavy romantic component to it. 
I don't know if any of that made sense. All that to say, I did enjoy it, we'll continue to read from Emily Henry, but it surprised me because I was expecting it to be much closer to a real romance, which is, I think, fair to call Beach Read. It's sort of on the bubble, but I do think Beach Read reads much more like an actual slow burn romance, and um, I kind of was wanting or expecting that from this, and I didn't quite give me that to the degree I wanted it to. And then the next surprise I wanted to mention is The Hammer of Thor, which is the second book in the Magnus Chase trilogy from Rick Riordan. And I really enjoyed this. I gave this four stars. It surprised me because it went a place with Sam, who is the main like kind of best friend character to Magnus Chase in this series. It went places with her. I wasn't expecting it to and I really liked it. I don't want to give things away. And then it also introduced this character named Alex, who is gender queer or like, yeah, gender queer, I think, because Alex has the ability to um, shape shift. And it's basically literalizing the metaphor of being gender non-conforming because some days Alex is using she, her pronouns. Other days, Alex is using he, him. It has explicit sort of discussions about Alex's identity as a trans character. And anyway, I just wasn't expecting that to be a part of this book. And I thought it was a really interesting discussion in a, the context pretty light middle grade verging into YA fantasy for that story element to be introduced the way it was. I can't speak to if that was good representation because I'm not a part of the community being represented, but it was, I thought, at least for me as a cisgendered person, an interesting kind of literalization of an ongoing discussion about what gender means and in a way that was, I perceived as being at least approachable to the age range it's targeted at. So anyway, I just wasn't expecting that from this and I thought that that added a really interesting layering to the overall character dynamics in this particular trilogy that I personally really liked. So I didn't like this as much as the first one. I think that this sort of suffers for like from the kind of middle book in a trilogy syndrome, which sometimes it just sort of gets the short end of the stick because it's having to like set up the big finale, which I think this was, but it was still a super enjoyable romp. I still laughed out loud at several places. We got like I was talking about really fun, interesting story moments. I also am writing so hard for Sam and Amir. They are so sweet and I just love them so much. I also think that he handles religion in this in a really thoughtful way. Now if uh, like I'm trying to project because Sam is Muslim but she's also a Valkyrie and her dad is Loki. So I know that when I was in kind of more conservative Christianity, if there was somebody who was supposed to be a faithful adherent of my religion being portrayed in the context of this, I don't know that I would have been super excited about it. But if you're somebody who is not necessarily as conservative within Islam, I, I suspect that you would enjoy the way that that gets handled. So I want to acknowledge that there probably would be a variety of responses to that representation. But I thought that it was cool and interesting that he went there with that character and really tried to hammer out like, what would it mean to be a faithful adherent to a religion and then also have your father be a quote unquote God? Like, how would you conceptualize that? I just thought that that was also really interesting. So all that to say, surprised by the places that Uncle Rick went in this particular middle grade fantasy and I really enjoyed it. Then the last surprise I wanted to mention, I just, you guys, this, I literally was reading this book I looked up from my Kindle, I looked over to my cat and said, what the hell am I reading right now? I read, <laughs> I read this book called Alien, what was it even called? Alien Quarantine Rescue. And this book, I think it, I, it surprised me. It helped me define the outer reaches of my personal comfort zone within romance. Like I can read some banana pants things, some bonkers books that are just meant to be silly fun. I think my difficulty with this book was that it was not a novella. I think I would have had a much more fun time with this if, had, if it had just been a novella. But having a full novel where the setup is there is a worldwide pandemic called the Birona virus. Corona, see what she did there? And everybody can't leave their house because you like will get sick and die if you come into contact with people, like it's just known. So people are stuck in their houses and like you get food, I guess, through like drones and stuff. And there's like this oppressive government that's come in. And all of a sudden our heroine has an alien who crash lands in her yard and he is a silver, 
a silver alien who's coming to mate with her because his species is dying out. They need females. They figured out that earthlings are like earth women are compatible with them. And he also has antibodies for this virus. And the way that <laughs> the way this virus, the way he transmits this virus is through his seed in his vibrating silver peen. And it was so over the top and bonkers. And there was... It was, I, I was literally speechless after it. I was like, you know, I like some Ruby Dixon, but Ruby Dixon actually has like some real themes and stuff. Ruby Dixon, I think has a little, little more seriousness in her books. And I also like a Jessica Kane, but Jessica Kane is probably the same level of bonkers, but it's a novella. And having these things into a full novel, it was too much for my little brain to handle. So... I gave it three stars because I felt like it did what it was trying to do, which was literalize like the idea of being like touch starved in a pandemic. Okay. And maybe I'm going to read more. I don't know. But it was honestly one of the wildest things I've ever read. <laughs> and then we'll just move straight into my hits. So I had two four stars I wanted to talk about, a four and a half and a five star. So first of the four stars is Ace by Angela Chen, I believe is the author. And this is a nonfiction book about asexuality. And this had been recommended very very highly to me from both Ashley of Bookish Realm and Bethany from Beautifully Bookish Bethany and totally warrants the recommendation because it is a really thought provoking exploration of what asexuality is and also things like how do asexual people or ace that's often sort of the abbreviation ace or aromantic is often called arrow. How do ace people come to be aware of this part of their sexuality? Why is there such an assumption of what's called allosexuality where you, you know, do experience sexual desire in a more sort of like typically portrayed way. Like, why is that such the default? And like, what are the implications of that? Where did that come from? What are the narratives around being sexual? And this was a really just thought, it's a very informative book if you're like me and we're just like generally like, oh cool, I have like an opportunity to learn more about like what, what does asexuality even mean? Um, because I had, you know, some ideas, but just getting a more detailed kind of nonfiction look into that, I appreciated just the education. But also I think that it invites a lot of good questioning and sort of, so I'd heard of this idea of like compet, which is compulsive heterosexuality. Sort of part of what it's critiquing is this assumed posture that everybody is assumed to be straight as opposed to queer in some way. And what this was talking about was comp sex, like comp sexuality, which is compulsive sexuality, this idea that we assume that everybody is sexual in the same way. And I think that this was a really the same way that I think it's beneficial and like a good part of just like learning about yourself and growing, you know, as a person in your own kind of identity, kind of examine if you are as straight as you're sort of encouraged to be to conceptualize yourself as I think similarly, it's totally like I appreciated it, ha like helping me like think through the experiences I've had and experiences other people I know have had and thinking through like, does this like match with me? And I think where I landed was like, no, like, I don't think that this actually does resonate with me and my experience. But I really appreciated a book that had so many stories from different people that gave you an opportunity to not only be learning, but also reflecting on your own experience and possibly learning something. I mean, I definitely think I did learn new things about my sexuality or even just sort of like addressing the boundaries of it. But potentially if you are somewhat ace maybe or like on like, you know, kind of this Kinsey scale of maybe not being totally aloe, maybe being a little bit more on the ace side. I think that this definitely could help you sort of explore that and like think through those experiences. So basically all that to say, I appreciated this both as a book that taught me about something, but also something that was structured in a way that invited like, I think really healthy reflection on myself and like my own identity, and also just the experiences of other people um, and things that have been shared with me over the years from friends. So really good nonfiction pick. And I listen to that as audio. So I also can recommend it to you in that format. The other four star I wanted to mention was Fugitive Telemetry by Martha Wells, which is the sixth entry in the Murderbot Diary series, which you guys know is one of my all time favorite series. Murderbot is one of my all time favorite characters. And this is the next entry in the Murderbot Diaries that I believe comes out either in late April or May. And it is just a really satisfying entry. I think if you like this series, you're really gonna like this book. It is a murder mystery <laughs> and Murderbot is, uh, uh, kind of playing detective. They've got kind of a nemesis in the station security force who doesn't think that they should be there and they're kind of like 
winning them over and proving them wrong. Um, we've got all, like not all, but a lot of our favorite kind of recurring characters are back in this one, along with some fun new ones. And Murderbot is at their absolute snarkiest in this one, and I was living for it. I really <laughs> enjoy just the tone of this one. I felt like I got all of the character moments that I enjoy from Murderbot. Um, I don't, uh, would you enjoy this as a standalone? I think you should at least read All Systems Red before you read this, just so that you can kind of know the world and the vibe. But yeah, I don't think you need to, it's like not necessarily moving the plot forward, like the macro plot forward that much. It's more of just like a really enjoyable side quest. And then finally, we'll talk about my two highest rated ones. First, I'm gonna say The Soulmate Equation from Christina Lauren. I gave this four and a half stars. And this is just, it's, it's probably my second favorite Christina Lauren book after the Unhoneymooners because this just really hit a lot of like what I love best from them. They just write these really like they or they can sometimes I'm, I'm a little hit or miss with Christina Lauren some of their books it's not that they're not well done they're just not as much my thing but this one was very much my thing because it had a lighter comedic tone it's a hate to love and fake dating trope with like a little bit of spe it's it reads like a contemporary it has like a light sousson of speculativeness because the premise is basically a dating service based on DNA matching which is like kind of speculative technology but it reads mostly like a contemporary. And um, our main character is a single mom. I actually thought that the kid, by the way, sometimes I don't like the way kids are portrayed in romance. I thought this was a better portrayal of a kid than we normally get in romance. So I appreciated that. She's a single mom and she kind of through machinations ends up putting her DNA in the database. And it turns out she is matched to the kind of like founder of the company or like the inventor of the technology. And they have like the highest rated matching that they've ever seen before. But he is also kind of an asshole who she knows from like this coffee shop they both go to and um, she doesn't really like him. So they are getting paid, she's getting paid to attempt to date him. So she doesn't have to like do any anything that she's not comfortable with, but like she has to at least spend time with him. And because of some other reasons, she needs money and so she's gonna do it. And he, the, the part of this that was the hardest for me is that he is genuinely pretty unlikable at the front and like the transition from that to them being fully in love I don't know that I totally bought and that's what dinged it down a half star for me but I just had such a good time with this the sidekick like the found family or like the family dynamics in this were really fun he has a great family and then she has these really sweet grandparents that are in her life and her daughter is a good character she has this great like ride or die bestie named Fizzy who I'm really hoping gets another book like like I hope they'll do a spinoff for Fizzy because she was very endearing. All in all, I just really love this as a contemporary romance. It was super fun. Highly recommend. Had a great time with it. I think this comes out in May. And then the coup de grace. I originally gave this four and a half stars, but upon reflection, I was like, no, this is one of my all time favorite classics I've ever, ever read. So it needs to be a five star. This was on my five star prediction list. So good job me for like actually for once correctly calling that. Uh, and that is The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. <sighs> I really love this guys. So I feel like I had never read any Anne Bronte before and she also is always sort of like the undersung sibling of the Brontes. And I was doing, I was reading the introduction to this and then also I have a different edition of this book. Um, I was reading those introductions just to like learn frankly more about and in this book, because I think I may use it for a video essay I'm working on about Jane Eyre, because I think there's some very interesting parallels between this and Jane Eyre that say interesting things about kind of maybe where the Brontes were coming from. But anyway, and it seems like Charlotte Bronte was a little ashamed of Anne Bronte's work or perspective. So she sort of like downplayed these books, like, cause she was a sibling who lived the longest and so got to kind of curate some of their legacy. And um, it seems like maybe she purposely kind of let Anne's work fall by the wayside a little bit because she felt like it was like controversial. I don't know. I think that's a real shame because I would say that this is my second favorite Bronte I've ever read. Like Jane Eyre is clearly, Jane Eyre is my all time favorite book. That is clearly my favorite. I like this better than Wuthering Heights and I like this better than any of the other Charlotte Bronte books I've read. So I just think that this is great. It has this main character or like our female lead is Helen and Helen is a fucking badass. I love Helen. She's so strong. This book has such interesting things to say about like, can people change? I think Anne's soteriology as sort of a the version of Christian universalism that was very prevalent in evangelicalism in England at the time shows up a lot in here in ways that I thought were really interesting. I really love 
like I just love that the subject matter this ends up tackling. I didn't know so the premise of this I should say is that this woman comes to live in this house in this town which is often the beginning of some of these kinds of stories. Sometimes it's a man sometimes it's a woman. She is a widow she has her son with her and she comes to live in uh, Wildfell Hall in this community and the established families like there's basically just a lot of gossip about her and I had ideas like going into this book I kind of knew that was a setup I had ideas about what I thought like her actual backstory might be and I am so I was totally wrong and I really really love what her actual backstory ends up being I just love everything about that. The only thing, the original the reason I originally gave this four and a half stars was that her kind of, the, the dude, the like narrator of this is this guy named Gilbert. Now his whole family vibes are really fun. He has this like very pretentious teen, teen little brother named Fergus who's very funny. But anyway, Gilbert is our narrator and he is just sort of like a derpy derp. Like I don't love him and he's ultimately meant to be her love interest and I'm just like but I just feel like Helen deserves better. So I originally I dinged it down a little bit for that but I just I, Gilbert's not enough to overcome how much I love Helen and you know what if Helen wants Gilbert like okay fine. So anyway <laughs> I made my peace with this fictional character and her romantic preferences but yeah anyway all that to say gushing really really enjoyed this book. I loved it. One of my all-time favorite classics. Did not disappoint and um, I've heard Agnes Grey is quite a different book but I am very excited to to read it. Maybe I'm gonna put that on my t my classics TBR for next year because this definitely has heightened my appreciation for Anne Bronte and her uh, I think just all the parallels between this and Jane Eyre are fascinating and just thinking kind of contrasting this book to the style of her two sisters who are better known. It's just a very interesting thought exercise. Anyway I'm gushing. Love this. And with that being said, I think that that will do it for me for now. So that was my reading. Definitely let me know how your reading in the month of March went. Let me know what you thought about any of the books that I talked about today. And yeah, I think that that will do it for me for now. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social meds if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. Oh, along with uh, a link to where I got this awesome support your lo local library vintage shirt uh, and a discount code if you're interested. And I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today, and I will just talk to you soon. Bye!